Well, welcome, everybody. Um, this meeting is going to be recorded and posted to the OATS website and YouTube channel for the benefit of those who can't join us today. And uh, welcome to the Organic Advisor Call Series. I'm your host, Nate Powell Palm, the training specialist for OATS. And this series is brought to you by the Organic Agronomy Training Service. This is our 18th episode, so please visit the OATS website and view the call schedule and list of topics. And if you haven't done so already, I highly recommend signing up for the newly launched Organic Advisor Listserv, where we'll be having some great conversations right in your inbox on all things related to advising organic farmers. And the link to sign up is going to be in the chat. Well, that's pretty much it for housekeeping. Uh, let's get started with today's conversation. My guest today is Clint Jessen. And Clint holds a BS from the University of Wyoming in agricultural economics and with his wife and three kids runs Jess and Wheat Company and operates out of Pine Bluffs, Wyoming. He's a fifth generation wheat farmer and produces wheat and edible beans, corns, barley, hay and other grains um, and has been certified organic for over 20 years. So excited to hear all of this experience. Um, Clint also owns Jessen Agribusiness, which operates Wyoming's only certified organic elevator, and that's going to be a big theme of our conversation today. So welcome, Clint. Just to get us kicked off, would you mind telling us how you got into farming? I know a lot of folks grow up fifth generation, but a lot of them leave. So what helped you come back to the farm and make a business out of it? Um, I have a, a crazy story. I guess let, first let me start off by saying thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, it's a little early this morning, but it works out well. Um, and that is a, a great question. And I don't even believe that uh, you know the answer to this, but uh, um, I have a, a consorted backstory in, in terms of I was in college at the University of Wyoming. I was majoring in farm economics. Um, coming back to the farm wasn't necessarily the uh, initial upfront plan of my education, I guess, if you will. Um, initially, I thought maybe I'd end up <clears throat> in, in law or something like that on the ag side. And uh, my backstory is, is I'm an only child and an only grandchild of, of our okay. farm. And in the year 2000, my grandparents and my parents all passed away. I was a senior um, in college at the University of Wyoming. And uh, I had this very unique opportunity um, to either decide whether or not to, you know, sell the family farm and keep going with the direction that I was heading uh, educationally or, or come back to the farm. And so growing up, um, you know, I loved all my summers out here. I knew how to sit on the tractor. I knew how to run the combine. Um, I had no clue how to run a business um, whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, that was... That was something that was very new to me. Um, and at the time in the year 2000, there was this really cool thing with the IRS about uh, a form 706 where you could waive inheritance taxes if I promised to farm for 10 years. At that time, I was uh, relatively young and I thought, you know what, it's 10 years. Um, I can do that. Let's try it. And so that really started uh, my farming career and my farming journey, I guess, on my own, so to speak. Um, I do have quite a large uh, family tree on the outside of, of my little uh, one branch that I had. Um, and so I had a lot of uh, really good mentors along the way in terms of um, our family and our my network of support in terms of how to be a farmer and where to go to buy fuel, um, how to hire an employee. Um, a lot of business things that I did not know what to do or how to do. Obviously, I knew how to sit on the tractor for an exorbitant amount of hours every day, but I did not know how to balance my books and pay payroll and pay payroll taxes. And a lot of the nuances that went into actually running a business, not only just a farm. And it was a, a baptism by fire, so to speak. And uh, it's mm -hmm. been a journey and I'm, and I'm still here um, 23, almost 24 years later. Uh, I'm still here. I still enjoy it. And uh, we're still rocking and rolling. Well, so could you say a little bit more about that mentorship ecosystem? I think that's something that in organic, we are really interested in figuring out. I think in agriculture generally, you know, with uh, with the average age of the farmer being 65 plus, 
and how do you teach folks who aren't immediately uh you know, already on the farm, growing up on the farm, teach them how to farm. And I think to your point, teach them how to run a business, which is probably the harder part of farming. Um, so who who were those mentors and how did, uh, how did you foster those relationships as you're getting started? I was uh, maybe annoying. Um, I had three cousins that uh, farmed in this area and mm -hmm. I would literally show up um, for lunch at their farm and say, hey, how do I buy tillage equipment? How do I, how do I expand? How do I do this? Or, you know, very, could be very simple. Like who's your accountant? Like, um, yeah. how do I, um, how do I set up an LLC? There was a lot of, um, things that I just didn't know. You don't know what you don't know. And so, mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of mistakes that I made along the way, of course. Um, because I, I would make a decision and, and that was wrong. But the, the beautiful thing is I could make another decision. Um, and so I learned a lot on my own, but I also did have a lot of, um, hey, this is the time of year that we do this. And this is the reason why. So actual on-farm knowledge of um, we plant usually around this time and we harvest around this time and, and things like that. Um, but honestly, at the end of the day, there was a lot of self-learning and mistakes um some of them were very costly and some of them worked out really well um and so it, it was uh very advantageous and like i said i'm still i'm happy to be here still yeah absolutely when when looking at um so i'll jump on the question about your organic journey in just a second but it sounds like you had mostly conventional mentors for just those those regular how-to questions is that correct so, yes, I would say conven very conventional uh, mentors. Actually, everybody in my family is uh, conventional. I'm the only black sheep, um, if uh -huh. you will. And uh, I guess I'll kind of answer your question with another question was or another answer um, and don't want to jump ahead too far. But we have always been organic. Um, mm. My grandfather and father were organic before that was a, uh, a niche term, um, if you will, in terms of. Um, before there was a premium, before there was paperwork, we had farmed that way just from an economic standpoint of being the low cost producer out here in Wyoming, Colorado, and Nebraska, a very dry and arid um, area. And so uh, my grandfather and father's farming mentality was you, you only put in um, the bare minimum. And then anything you get out of that is, is the bonus part. And that's how we've always been. And that's how we made it. And, and so, <clears throat> excuse me, we have always been organic. We just weren't, uh, doing the paperwork and, um, realizing any of that premium. That's fascinating. I, when I think about how, uh, how uh, pretty rare that was, especially for folks who survived the eighties, got through the nineties, and then when you're coming in, uh, stayed without those synthetic inputs. That's pretty incredible. Well, so you you started this this uh, this journey um, as organic. How did you you know decide to you know get into certification? Look to finding and building markets in organic. How was that all uh, that path made clear to you? Um, so I guess uh, it goes back to being relatively new in the industry, and I would travel all over go to trade shows and go to meetings and go anywhere I could to find information of how to make this work, right? Like uh, in the early days, uh, very hungry and ambitious, I guess, if you will, on, on um, proving that I could be here and I could do this. And so I was at a, a wheat growers meeting and I met a grain buyer. He, he got to stand up. He was a sponsor. Um, he was from California and he was offering a premium for anyone who could become certified organic in the, in the area. And the guy was looking specifically for hard red winter wheat. Um, and so after he gave his spiel um, at the conference, I went up and I spoke with him and I said, Hey, I think that we fit what you're looking for. And we're already farming this way that uh, is, is organic. Um, I said, but I don't know anything about how to become certified. Um, I don't know any of those hoops to jump through. And the buyer actually helped me out um, to get me. He's like, hey, here's the here's the list of certifiers. I believe at that point there was 
maybe only three or four certifiers in the U.S. Um, I could be wrong. That's not a, an actual statistic, but there wasn't very many to choose from. And we chose this company out of Ohio and the buyer themselves had a good rapport with them. And uh, we, we started off on that journey in 2000 and a lot of the record keeping that is required for organic really became quite helpful as a management tool of the farm to begin with because mm -hmm. of the fact that I, I really honestly think even looking back now it's organic is was not only successful for us and 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 added added uh, sustainability for us but it it taught me how to be a good record keeper and a really good business person to begin with and how to keep track of everything um, a lot of the pieces that I was missing um, in my management as uh, the CEO I guess of a, of a small farm and so it was really advantageous. And then on top of that, there was, you know, this, this small premium, which at the time the premiums in organic was quite small, you know, 25, 50 cents a bushel over and above, you know, mm -hmm. conventional, that was the extra part that, uh, that allowed sustainability, allowed us to look good to, to bankers and, and things like that to allow us to grow. And so, that is uh, kind of how we got uh, certified organic and, and started on that journey back in 2001 was our first year certified. And uh, it, it was fantastic. As, you, as you've worked to, um, to, to be an organic producer in, in Southeast Wyoming, um, how has that ecosystem been for you? Have, how have your neighbors perceived it? How have you, know, have, have you seen other folks go organic and sort of following your lead? Um, what's been the uptake of organic since you went organic? Um, at first, a lot of our neighbors thought we were just, you know, crazy. But you know, from the outside, from the windshield tour from the neighbors, we weren't really doing anything that different um, in mm -hmm. terms of our actual farming practices. Um, but we did, you know, very on in the early days, we got, uh, you know, labeled as, uh, you know, hippies and, you know, that we wear tie dye shirts and Birkenstocks and we're out here with a shovel and growing, you know, vegetables and, and like things like that. There was a, you know, maybe a little bit of negativity, but as, as time progressed, a lot of people in our area, surprisingly, even like some of the older generations was like, Hey, I too am organic. So in this area in general, um, a lot of the land in around uh, Pine Bluffs, Wyoming, Southeast Wyoming was already being farmed organically because the mindset of all the farmers around here, was also to be the low cost producer. And so mm -hmm. um, with exception of the, you know, the large irrigated farms and the sugar beets and uh, the large corn farmers in the area, um, most of the dryland acres in this area were probably certifiable or really close mm -hmm. to certifiable because um, fertilizer, uh, you know, synthetic fertilizer in general, sometimes has a negative uh, uh, backlash here where if you fertilize in June uh, and you top dress your wheat with a synthetic fertilizer and it doesn't rain and it doesn't carry, it has a tendency to burn the crop. And so a lot yeah. of times there was a, a large amount of acres in the area that were certifiable. And so now uh, fast forward to 2023, I believe Laramie County, Wyoming is one of the hotspots of organic grain produced um, in the United States. Uh, I believe last I saw that 60, 70,000 acres in our area is certified organic. And there's a lot of certified organic producers in our area. In fact, there's even meetings and um, get togethers and things like that. And buyers host dinners and, and everything. So it, it really has blossomed in the last 23 years into something quite amazing, which kind of goes to the elevator and we can talk about that later, but um, it, it's really been um, a natural organic growth in the industry in this area. We've had a few folks jump on since we first started talking. So let me reintroduce you. My guest today is uh, Clint Jessen and he and his wife, Ashley farm in Southeast Wyoming, based out of Pine Bluffs. And he's a fifth generation wheat farmer raising edible beans and corn and other grains. Um, but he also owns Jessen Agribusiness, which is Wyoming's only certified organic grain elevator. Um, and so welcome everybody who's joined and is on the call. 
Um, Clint shared with us a little bit about how he got into organic, uh, has been certified organic for 20 plus years. Um, and we just were walking up to the idea of a grain elevator, an organic grain elevator. So Clint, I am dying to hear how you became the proprietor of an organic grain elevator and what the logistics, the business challenges, all of the things that went into making that happen. So uh, again, kind of, uh, it was very, the growth that we've had has been very organic. And I, I use that uh, little cheek and tongue, a little bit of a pun. Um, but early on in the organic industry, um, all of a sudden that was maybe one of the biggest changes of the farm was um, when I took over the farm immediately after harvest, we all took all of our crops to the local co-op. We, we stored it in there and whether you sold or played the market or the futures market or anything on that side of it, it was okay because there was very little on farm storage at the time. Um, even here, a lot of farmers had gotten away from on farm self storage, I guess, if you will. So fast forward to becoming certified organic, we can no longer do that. And so we started building uh, on farm grain storage here so we could work with buyers from much further away, right? There wasn't necessarily a local buyer that was purchasing grain um, at the local level without trucking it. So there was this strange logistic issue. And so we started building our own uh, bins. And um, I guess I'll get into a little bit of the marketing side because this also comes into play with the elevator was for the first five years of being organic, we sold to one, I'm going to say local-ish um, buyer that was 100 miles away, um, Denver, Colorado area, and they would take the grain and everything was fine. And we were happy receiving this, a, a premium, a small premium, and everything was kind of hunky-dory. And then uh, at like year five, there was a super surplus of organic grain, particularly in our area. A lot of other producers were coming online and getting certified and they also had crops. And this one local buyer could no longer handle all of the volume. And so um, I was in a panic. I, I didn't know what to do, honestly. I was like, what do you mean you don't wanna buy my wheat? I raised it for you, you've bought it every year. Um, I have no idea who else is the buyer. I've never looked for another buyer. I've never done anything. And so long and the short of it is I started scouring the internet and uh, I found a, a very large buyer in, in Michigan and I reached out to them and I said, hey, look, I have some um, several hundred truckloads of organic grain. Um, can you help me out? Are you guys in the market? Are you buying? Um, I'm kind of going upside down here. It was a very scary time on the farm. And they said, yes, in fact, not only would we buy your grain, we would like to source, you know, half a million bushels of grain. Can you help us do this? And yeah. so there was a lot of other producers um, locally who were in the same boat as we were. And I started this little coffee shop marketing club called WOW, which is uh, stands for Wyoming Organic Wheat. And uh, I got four or five other producers together. It was very informal. There was no legal LLC or anything done. It was just a group of us that got together and said, hey, you know what? We can come up with four or 500,000 bushels of wheat collectively um, to supply this, this very large buyer. And it really opened my eyes that there was way more to the market than what I initially thought, right? And then this buyer was like, hey, not only will we take all this grain, but we need a year round supply of it. We can't just... Just because you harvested it all in August doesn't necessarily mean we're going to take it all in September. And so they really were looking for this, you know, year long, consistent guarantee of, of product for them to make their product, I guess. And so it kind of launched all of the, I guess, the storage piece of the puzzle where we started building um, large amounts of grain bins. In fact, we would build storage uh, beyond our current needs, of course, um, to be able to not only handle our grain, but handle the neighbor's grain and where we could bring in their grain and store it because they at the time um, didn't have the storage or maybe they only had a few bins and they themselves couldn't hold the entire crop or their entire year and, and sit on it and then ship it out. And so 
that kind of started the storage process. Um, and then it was a little serendipitous, I guess, if you will. Um, we have a local, we had a local grain elevator here that was only open during wheat harvest. Um, it was small, 400,000 bushel grain elevator, country elevator, I guess, in the middle of nowhere. And it was on rail. And it was only open 30 days out of the year. And since we had all kind of shifted to this self storage, um, when I was a kid, that local country elevator would fill up in, in three days. It was full. And then yeah. you still had to, you still had to truck at 30 miles to town or whatever. Um, and then in its last year of operation, they only took in 28 truckloads. Mm. And so the local co-op and the boards that be, and there was some mergership um, on the co-op side and, and they got much larger in Nebraska and stuff. And they came to me and said, Hey, we no longer have use for this elevator. Would you be interested in purchasing it? And I was like, Ooh, that's, that's kind of a big step that I didn't, I didn't foresee in my, in my future, in my plan. And, of and, and sorry, back up just a, just a sec. So what year are we at here? You've taken over the, 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 the we're at 2015. 2000. Okay. Okay. Please, please continue. And so um, in 2015, at the long, long and short of it is, we ended up purchasing a grain elevator, um, this local country elevator. And it turned out to be a labor of love. Um, we, uh, running an elevator is very expensive. Um, it put, it, there was especially uh, a, uh, a grain elevator, country elevator that was only open, you know, uh, very light operational, um, was not used to the volume that we thought that we could mm -hmm. push through there. And so uh, at the end of the day, we, we we put on new motors and bin fans and cleaned up all the bins and, and organized it and made it quite nice. And then also at that point in time in 2015, we became certified organic handlers. Mm -hmm. um, and I obtained a, um, a broker's license um, from our state. And so I allowed me to, to broker grain and we have our state warehouse license and we got um, our moisture meter and our protein tester and all this stuff certified through the state. And then we became bonded and it, it just became this juggernaut of uh, additional side business, I guess, if you will, which at the end of the day really helped out the farm in terms of um, our employees and keeping them busy year round and things like that. And then um, so that was the first uh, couple of years. And basically it was just storage. Um for not only myself, but also for this local wow group that I had started and this current buyer that we had. Um, it offered something really fantastic for me in the fact that I now had this great ability to blend grain and make protein and make basically a recipe for a slew of other buyers. And it kind of opened up our marketing potential to be able to create needs on site here before it's shipped out and allow the the buyer um, to buy exactly what they wanted you know whether they wanted exactly 10 percent protein or 14 percent protein or or whatever we were able to fix that here before it was shipped out thus saving the buyer money and uh, allowing us to basically expand our business when you uh first bought the business it was four hundred thousand bushels have you expanded it to a more capacity so we have 400,000 bushels at the elevator, and then we have 250,000 bushels here on farm, which is just a mile away. Um, sure. and, okay. and so that is our, our total capacity, but we really work hard within those bins and that space um, to roll those bins several times a year um, and, okay. and kind of keep it fresh and, and have um, multiple product mixes within that, the, the grain elevator itself available for sale. With the challenges of segregation, do you are you a, a dedicated organic elevator? We are a hundred percent organic. Uh, we do zero conventional whatsoever. It's just easier that way. Absolutely, that's awesome. Um, what other crops do you handle at the elevator besides just hard red winter wheat? Um, we handle quite a bit of corn. Um, okay, and so I'll, I'll digress just slightly. Um, the first couple of years of owning the elevator, it was just storage. And then um, in 2018, I believe, we added, we activated the rail siding. Um, mm -hmm. The rail siding um, then became imperative to uh, very large feed buyers on the West Coast. And so th that added a whole nother product mix 
which and then kind of brought in the the organic corn um, because we're able to um, actually clean the corn at the elevator and issue a uh, corn borer certificate, which is required for all, all West Coast uh, feed and corn going out that direction. And so but you speak a little, bit, oh, to, a little bit more to the testing that you have to do upon receiving what specs do you test for and how do you um, do, is there anything that you can't test for on site that you have to send away for? Um, so there, there's only one test, I guess, within the grain market that we don't actually test for. And it's because it's not a prevalent issue here, which is like vomitoxin. I know mm -hmm. that is uh, something that is very big elsewhere. Um, but we just don't get the humidity and we don't get the uh, the moisture um, that there really is ever any vomitoxin here in our area. That is a, a very East Coast type of grain issue. And so yeah. we don't test for any vomitoxin. But here, basically, a load, of, a load of wheat hits the scale, comes in through the elevator. It goes in through the computer. It's very, I guess, on the up and up in terms of it, it's no different delivering to our elevators. It is delivering conventional crop to the to the local elevator. We run the we, we probe every truck. We bring it in. We look for stones. Um, we do a moisture test. We do a protein test. We do test weight grading, um, dockage, um, anything like that. And then on corn. Um, we actually even take it a step further and we grind up the corn basically with, uh, we put on our lab coats and we grind up the corn with a coffee uh, grinder and we add uh, diluted water and we run a slew of tests to it to make sure that it actually is organic. And so we can actually test if there's any of our corn that's inbound that's coming in is genetically modified in any way, shape or form. And we're very strict, uh, about, uh, very strict about that, making sure that that integrity is uh, maintained because especially where we're just usually storing corn, it's not just my corn. Um, we wanna make sure that we are not in any way, shape or form gonna cross contaminate anything. And so we'll break it down to the parts per million and make sure that there's no genetically modified corn in there. There's really no such thing as a test on that for wheat at this point in time. And there really hasn't been an issue yet. I mean, I heard that there's some commercially genetically modified wheat in uh, Latin America, but as of right mm -hmm. now, it's not here. And so we don't actually even have a test for that. When you're um, thinking about uh, kind of your journey into building this business, is it just you or how did you, as you said, it's an expensive proposition. How did you go from farming to having uh, the resources in the right place to be able to do justice to this, this opportunity? A really good banker. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, tell us a little bit more about that relationship, because I think that's something a lot of organic guys struggle with, guys in and and all farmers, is having your banker understand the organic value proposition. I think I think there was a lot of convincing early on um, that we weren't mm -hmm. crazy, um, and I also think on the backside. You know, being a banker, they also got to see the the cash flow side of, hey, if I do this, I will receive this premium. And so they were um, they got to see it. And then again, I, I think regionally really helped that we weren't the only ones in the area that were um, organic. And so the first couple of years were a little different. Number one, I was a brand new fresh faced producer with, uh, you know, little to no credit history, I guess, if you will. Um, and so we really relied heavily on the land base in order to borrow money to buy the elevator, to buy the new protein tester, to expand and, and make it all work um, by borrowing. And so we were able to you know, show all the bankers along the line that, hey, this can be profitable and I just need you guys to take a chance with me. And so there yeah. was a you know, obviously some hiccups along the way, particularly that um, that first uh, year of year five when the, the buyer just didn't buy my wheat. I, I, I go back to that because as painful as that was for me to call my banker and say, hey, look, um, I can't pay my operating note because I don't have a, a buyer um, really led to something that was quite beautiful, I guess. So, you know, some of our, our greatest successes were our, our failures, I guess, if you will, in terms of, hey, how did you do this where um, we had to do this? And, and thank goodness that there was this, this slew of other buyers that was out there. And I think at that point in time, from the consumer side, there was this new demand. 
which was really yeah. fantastic in terms of um, cereal grains. And it wasn't just um, bread that was sold at some corner store that was organic. Um, it really started to become in, in the early 2000s, mid to late 2000s, it started to become very mainstream and the demand was there. And not only the demand for just one product line, but 20, 30, 40, 50 different product lines that could be made in there. Um, and so the demand started to grow as we grew um, our operation and it was really advantageous. When you've been recruiting new customers, um, do, I guess, what forms does your grain go out? Are you sending out clean and totes, clean and trucks? Is it being broken down and ground in any way? Um, we don't usually do uh, uh, another value added process here. We really like, right. we, I prefer bulk wholesale. Um, however, I say that cheek and tongue for a while, we were doing truckloads of 50 pound bag wheat um, for sprouts. Um, we can do that. Um, the other value, at, you know, we can issue the corn borer certificate and we can clean the corn here and make sure that those buyers are. Um, at the end of the day, I didn't want to take it to that next level. And, and mostly because of the headaches that that creating a refined product ready for a shelf store um, was something that I didn't want to handle at that point in time in terms of making our own flour. I'd rather supply the whole grains that go to the flour mill um, rather than, than me taking it that step. And, and maybe in the sure. future, that's a, a possibility. Um, the, uh, the insurance just seems uh, almost insurmountable and the, you know, the product recall stuff that you have to carry to get into with some of these large buyers and get some shelf space. And, and that was really, a that's a whole nother portion of a business that, uh, I wasn't necessarily prepared or I haven't been yet prepared to, uh, to dive into. Fair, totally fair. If we could jump back a little bit to WOW, um, there's so much talk about, or at least I've heard so much talk about uh, like regenerative agriculture investment, where VCs and investment funds are all looking for how do we put money into a regenerative ag to help scale this. And I think when you've been talking about WOW, it strikes me as um, there has to be a significant amount of trust in a group like that to be able to say, yes, I trust that without, you know, making a new company or having a lot of uh, a lot of lawyers involved, we're going to coordinate in a way that is going to move much more than one farm's grain through this entity to aggregate to, to access these big buyers. Could you speak to like what you think the recipe is for um, socially building an elevator where there's there's the trust and the confidence in those who will be sending their grain to the elevator to make it work? Uh, at this point in time, knowing what I know now, um, I we probably should have done it more legally. A handshake really right. works well when everybody's happy, but it only takes one person not to be happy. And so at this point now, I would, you know, if you were looking at uh, building a community grain elevator somewhere, I would really set it up like a, like a co-op. Um, okay. very, very similar to what our local conventional co-ops are now in terms of, Hey, here's, here's X number of dollars that everybody puts in. And mm -hmm. here is, um, everybody gets this amount of shares or this amount of ownership. And, and we think we can do this kind of volume through and, or, and then at the end of the day, maybe at worst case scenario, it's just a, a really brilliant, uh, storage plan, um, sure. yeah. that allows for IP. And so the elevator was mutually beneficial at the time in terms of everybody bringing in their own product and mm -hmm. we would i would pay them out um which was another portion of the business that uh i learned hard and fast like i was taking farm operating money and buying my neighbor's grain so the neighbors were happy and then i was you know reselling it to the buyer and the profit margins were very slim at that point in time in terms of, of other people's grain. And so we eventually kind of got out of that to where now we have seven or eight different buyers that use our grain elevator um, and buy from it. So it works like this now uh -huh. where I will get a call from a local producer and say, hey, I sold a rail car of wheat to buyer X. Can they send in their rail car and you load it? And so we get on the Union Pacific board and we, we work out all the logistics and we see that it's coming in next Tuesday. And I call the producer 
And then we just charge a flat fee for, for loading their rail car and using our siding. Okay. It, yeah. it worked out to be way more advantageous than me going out, buying that producer's grain, then ordering the rail car and then loading the rail car and, and working out all those logistics. It was much easier if I just provided almost a, uh, my own community service at this point um, is kind mm-hmm. of how it is. Um, we no longer truly buy neighbor's grain through our grain elevator. We just allow a lot of the producers in our area know that they can market their grain if they have a, a certain buyer, um, whether we know them or not, um, that is willing to to load through our elevator and we just charge a, a per bushel fee. And it works out so much nicer for us financially. It works out well for the buyer and it works out well for the producer. So at this point mm-hmm. in time, the elevator is almost... Um, I don't know, like uh, a community service, I guess, if you will, for all of the producers. Totally, yeah. there. Um, and it works out really well. And so it kind of mitigated multiple ownership within the elevator uh, and, you know, kind of took out any potential infighting or anything that was inside of there in terms of management and just allowed everybody to to use the elevator and we charge a fee through the um, the bushels. And it works Are out. Are you really able well. Are you able to still do the service of blending those different qualities to to meet the specs? We are on we it works out really well, you know, where we have multiple bins and multiple augers running into a bin. And so um, we've kind of got it figured out. Most of the rail business is done out, um, I'd say is is predominantly feed based uh, that goes west coast, whether that's corn or or um lower quality grains, I guess, if you will. Um, there's a handful of uh, high-end buyers that uh, come in that are making artesian wheat um, that use the rail. Um, and we still do a, a lot of trucking out of the elevator as well. And so it's mm-hmm. it's busy uh, six days a week, uh, which works yeah. out really well. We, we hired, a, a, we have a full-time uh, elevator manager that his entire job is to handle inbound and outbound loads all day long and uh basically manage the elevator it it works out really well as you look to other um communities say you know on the east coast in the south uh, uh, in the northwest all over the country um uh, do you think that there is a uh again a certain recipe for how to identify a site that isn't overbuilt is like the the right characteristics to meet the needs of a community kind of in the in the way you're describing where it's more of a community service um that you would say uh you know instead of folks saying i need 10 million dollars to build a new one it seems like there's a lot of infrastructure that's being underutilized around the country but um, but what what would those key characteristics, if you were to go to repeat this process in somewhere else in the country, would you look for? I would say the first thing I would look for would be regional supply. Can enough okay. producers get together and supply that elevator um, that would make it worthwhile? Is there enough producers in the area? If you're the only organic wheat farmer on the East Coast, don't go buy an elevator um, and then truck in grain from further away um so i might making sure that there's enough producer input into the uh the grain elevator and then also making sure that there's enough demand out of the elevator where yeah you know i would you know if if a grain elevator going into it from a business point of view if before a a group of uh, buyers could would purchase an elevator i would look for some type of guaranteed offtake agreement where they have a dedicated buyer to buy the products that are going to come through the elevator. Um, That really would probably make the banker feel better about loaning the money to purchase the elevator, right? To Mm -hmm. know that, you know, it doesn't even necessarily have to be incredibly profitable on the start, but just enough to get um, your foot in the door and and get a group going and make sure that there was product in and product out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think that there's, um, well, actually, let me reintroduce you. We've had some folks jump on. Some of my guests today is Clint Jessen. He's the owner of Jessen Agribusiness, which is by no means only organic uh, elevator and uh, and also the head uh, of his farming operation. For folks in the audience, please go ahead and drop any questions you have in the chat. Some of you are, have already done so, um, but we're uh, we're happy to, to get those answered as they come. Um, 
looking at uh, at sort of the the future as you see organic growing, um, are there more and more folks coming online in your area? Um, and do you see the elevator as sort of that confidence booster saying, I know I have somewhere to go with my grain if I make the leap and take my operation certified organic? I think at this point, um, we haven't necessarily reached uh, market saturation in this in this area, but I think everybody who who could be organic or wants to be organic probably already is at this point. Um, and mm -hmm. so I'm not necessarily sure that there's going to be a lot of organic growth acre wise here um, for mm -hmm. us looking to the future. What we're looking for is to possibly dedicate some bins um, to further IP the grain. Um, like yeah. certified organic regenerative grain and and look for that market and create that market. And I think that's the the next step in this area is to become regenerative certified and find all these appropriate climate practices that meets that uh, group of, uh, you know, checks those boxes off. And then mm -hmm. from an elevator point of view, come in and um, IP those those grains in a dedicated bin for a dedicated buyer i guess if you will i think sure. that that is, that is uh possibly the future maybe maybe some new additional bin storage um or or some additional um cropping in terms of peas and or cover crop sales in terms of or raising grass seed out here or or something ad additional to the regen space I think that the uh, the organic market isn't necessarily tapped out, but I think in terms of acre growth in this area, I think we're probably right at the peak, possibly. Yeah. And, and so, so looking I, at them, adding I think more value to those acres then. Exactly. I think at this point, everybody's like, hey, how can I make more of a premium or more of a positive climate impact in me being a farmer? So True. being organic is great. How can we also, you know, be climate wise? And I really think that that's kind of the future at this point, at least from what I can see. Um, and so from an elevator manager point of view, we're, we're trying to make sure that we can accommodate um, basically those IP grains, whether that's a, a small 10,000 bushel bin or eventually we've got hundreds of thousands of bushels dedicated to a, a certain buyer who's willing to pay. And I think what we're waiting for as a producer from the farmer's point of view at this point is where is the premium? A lot of us got into the um, organic space to begin with because there was this, this premium. Not only was it environmentally positive at the point, but there was this extra added additional premium that kind of pushed people over the edge to do this type of practice. And I really think that the the buyers, and I guess ultimately it's got to come from the consumer side and saying, hey, I'm willing to pay more for this box of cereal, more for this loaf of bread at the store with my dollars to get this product. And so I really think it's got to be a little consumer driven and it's also got to be buyer driven in order for all this to be very successful. Definitely. So we have to be chasing that demand, making sure that I, that doesn't um, uh, a question from the chat. Do you offer um, custom storage? Can folks basically toll store their grains with you at this point? We do, as long as they're organic, um, for sure. Okay. Like we, we're we very uh, overly cautious of paperwork. Um, I'm sure yeah. that most organic producers are, you know, everything takes 10 seats of paper to do one thing. Um, and so uh, we do offer that. Uh, we're, we're, we store a lot of we uh, proso mill it for the neighbors that uh, it's certified organic and their buyer hasn't taken it yet. And they need to rent a, a 10,000 bushel bin um, mm -hmm. to get by for a couple months. And so we do offer a, a lot of that unique storage possibilities, whether it's peas or lentils or chickpeas or proso millet or, or corn storage uh, or whatever. Again, kind of back to that community service minded that we're offering a um, you know, a positive impact for everybody because sometimes a, a, a producer just needs a 10,000 bushel bin for six months and they don't want to go and lay out the $3 per bushel price plus concrete and, and augers just for that short term window. And if we can help them capitalize right. on some type of premium, um, it's a win, win, win. And we'll just, we rent the bin out. 
when you're looking at the mixing opportunities, so say you do have a, um, in my head, you're going to have a, a buyer who wants 14% protein, but you, you'll have a farmer come in possibly with a bang in 17%, another farmer come in with 12%, and you're going to be mixing them. If you only, if, if you only need a little bit of um, high protein to kind of push that that bulk of the lower protein stuff up. Um, will you still buy some spot loads to to mix and blend off, or is it really more still a community service if it's sold through? You're you're just a toll provider. Um, not me personally. Okay. Um, we have really gotten away from. I'm going to buy this load from this producer, and I'm going to buy this load from this producer, and I'm going to mix them together and sell it to this buyer. Normally what I do is I, I call the buyer. Um, I try to also help out the buyers. I know that sounds weird, but I really like this uh, relationship, not where I, uh, I don't necessarily prefer to be the middleman, but I know all the producers here and the buyer knows exactly what he wants. And so I, what yeah. I will do is I will go out, I will call the buyer and say, hey, I know you're looking for this spec of grain, um, very specific, you know, 14 protein. This, this producer A has 17 and this producer B has 12 and we can mix them together and I can offer that service for you. And then the buyer goes out and purchases the grain. And then yeah. we just handle the per bushel volume through the elevator. And it's it's really taken a lot of stress off of, gosh, if I don't get this guy's wheat moved, um, uh, it's so much cleaner and easier. And honestly, at the end of the day, um, the, the premium or the profit that the elevator makes is, is about the same. Right. And then I don't have to outlay all the cash and it's, Absolutely. uh, it, it's so much easier and cleaner that way. Mm -hmm. Um, in my, in, in my world, um, uh, and I've only ever worked in the organic space. I've not worked much in conventional, but it seems like co-ops are a place that have so many benefits for doing exactly as you're describing, allowing folks to cooperate so that no one person is risking at all um, when things can go you know, sideways. Um, when I've taken that question to other groups around the country, they have a really bad taste in their mouth about co-ops, um, mostly from like the big co-ops who they feel have not done right by the farmer. How do you make the pitch about cooperating and endeavoring in something like building an elevator um, where or folks who have a, a history of a certain perception about co-ops can maybe reconsider it. I would say it kind of goes back to my original comment about the, the offtake agreement in terms of if you're going to start a new co-op in a new location in a new area, making mm -hmm. sure that that trust is built up there, um, you yeah. know, where we'll, we'll have a producer sell a, a specific buyer 40,000 bushels of wheat and but they're only going to deliver the first 10,000 to make sure that they get paid on that first. Mm -hmm. Does that, does that make sense? So there's a lot of trust there. And I would say that financially money builds trust where, yep. Hey, this, I know that this buyer is golden. I mean, I know it, but I, I called this other producer just cold and said, Hey, I have a buyer for you. There is this level of trust, like, Oh, maybe we'll do a, just one or two rail cars of, of grain first and make sure that we get paid and everything is as it says it was. Um, and make sure that that level of trust is there and thus it it adds everything back to the elevator right it, it makes everybody trustworthy i mean also at the end of the day we're bonded and we're insured that there's a whole sure. nother level of trust through the state of wyoming um we're made sure that everything is on the up and up you can call at any point in time and get a settlement sheet um daily position logs all kinds of paperwork again because it's organic so there's 20 pieces of paper for every load of wheat. So it's really easy to, to trace. Right. And so yeah. I think that organic in general um, is uh, paperwork heavy, but there's a, that, that, that gives everybody a really nice warm fuzzy that they know where their grain is. Um, mm -hmm. I would say there was a, a very large buyer that, uh, you know, filed bankruptcy in the middle of the night. Um, we won't say any names. Um, but it caused some pandemonium, particularly on the elevator side, in particular on the trust side, that mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people got took and it was kind of in the middle of the night, close up shop. And everybody's like, what happened? And so yeah. um, I think that uh, everyone's still crawling out of that that hole. And there's a lot of people that, you know, we have some buyers that are OK to pay up front. Hey, I'm going to pay you mm -hmm. for 10,000 bushels of 
of wheat and I'm going to hope that the farmer shows up rather than, hey, sure, I'm going sure. to show that the uh, the buyer pays. So there's yeah. a, a, a lot of risk, I guess, uh, that we can mitigate by having the elevator. Uh, a, yeah. Like an extra shroud of protection for the producer and for the buyer. Because I can call the buyer mm -hmm. and say, hey, I have physically received the grain. Please pay this producer so we can order these other five rail cars or whatever. Right. And so but the rain's only traveled a mile so far. So not not the end of the world. Exactly. And so it is, uh, you know, I think our elevator can offer that. And this, you know, proverbial warm fuzzy of between the buyer and the mm -hmm. seller. Um, and that things are what they say they are. You know, if uh, a buyer comes in and says, hey, I'm looking for this 12% protein grain and the producer delivers it and my tests show that it's only 9% protein, I can call the buyer and say, hey, 9% protein, is this what you bought? Um, I don't get involved in their contracts or, or any of that or their delivery schedules or any of their payments, but I can say, I can, I can relay a service to the buyer and say, hey, I'm not sure if this is what you purchased or not, but this is what the test is showing from here. And then that buyer can can call that uh, producer back and say, hey, we needed the high protein or we needed the low protein or, or whatever. So it, it really yeah. kind of works out very well. Uh, with with the, the company that went bankrupt that shall not be named, um, I, I think this is really to top of mind for a lot of producers. One, getting in, if they heard their neighbor got burned, um, is organic, you know, just sort of a, something not to be trusted but um but two it seems like they're a prime example of what happens if one entity is just trying to get rich off this supply chain rather than trying to take you know as as i think you're describing where there's a fair fee for service but otherwise everyone's holding on to their margin from the farmer to the buyer everyone's getting a much fairer deal than having this big fat middle um didn't know if you could speak at all to that if you think like as folks talk about organic logistics, if you think it really is, we need to stick with co-ops and folks are coming in saying, we're going to have all this VC money, we're going to be able to, you know, buy and sell with big margins and make a decent or a really big profit, if that's really just not right for this, this space. I think it's right for this space, but we, it has to be done correctly, right? Just like mm -hmm. anything, like there has to be this, I feel long gone are the days of, wow where everything was a handshake. I think at this point, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, um, a handshake only goes so far. And I think at this point, there should be some actual legal documents um, produced. And that way, mm -hmm. everybody knows where they stand and what ground that they stand on beforehand, particularly if you're looking forward to, you know, setting up some type of cooperative within a new region, making sure that everybody there, before it's launched, before you, you buy it or whatever, that everything is set up and feels good. And I don't necessarily mm -hmm. think that, you know, VC money is bad or, or anything like that. But I think that as long as it's all um, clearly established from the very beginning, that um, everybody feels good about it and everybody knows what the target is. The target is to make sure that we're there for the producers or that um, we're there for the buyers um, because buyers come in routinely and also by these smaller country grain elevators that are unutilized and can offer a service within that community as well. And so, um, as long as everybody's a good, a good contract is always better than a handshake usually. Yes. Amen to that. Um, jumping back a little bit to the farming side, uh, could you tell us about what sort of crops are being grown organically in your region, what you grow, what your neighbors grow and what does well there and how you've built this business, uh, highlighting the, the capabilities of your region. So from the farm side, obviously we are in hard red winter wheat territory. This is uh, very well suited uh, for hard red winter wheat grains. Um, it stores very well, almost, you know, not quite for perpetuity, but it, it does very well in long-term storage here. And so that is something that uh, works well in our region. There's uh, a lot of proso millet, um, which is a, a grain uh, that's here. There's also a lot of hay millet. We raise quite a bit of hay millet because we're very well, well suited um, logistically to the large uh, organic dairies that are in Northern Colorado. Um, and so mm -hmm. that's that stuff that doesn't necessarily run through the, the elevator, right? Like this is this is trucking, this is hay, this is square bales um, to a lot, lot of the very large 
dairies that are set up in Colorado. Um, there's uh, dry edible beans, you know, blacks, whites, pintos, um, all that seems to, to grow very well here organically. Um, there's a, a large amount of hand labor, I guess, in our area. And so that is something that uh, a lot of the organic irrigated producers are, are um, willing to try and test that market. Um, barley grows really well here. And again, we have uh, some really good markets in Northern Colorado. There's the, the craft beer boom of, yep. of Colorado that uh, we've been able to capitalize on. So we really like barley. Um, it grows well here. Um, malt barley is fantastic. Um, other smaller crops, there's uh, lentils and chickpeas, um, yellow field peas, uh, things like that, that uh, a lot of people are experimenting with in terms of, oh, maybe we plant two, 300 acres of this and see how it works out. And so there's a lot of uh, forefront um, trying to be on the cutting edge of right on that regen, uh, organic regen purpose, I guess, that uh, a lot of people are looking at. And we're no different where it's, you know, we've had uh, incredible results with some cover crops and, and different mixes that we're trying as well um, to try and check those boxes for climate smart uh, farming. And um, yeah, I think at the end of the day, we're, we're well suited and we have it. Uh, very well versed logis logistically so you know even our yeah. elevator we're on the mainline up that is very advantageous yep. for us we're at the crossroads our location here we're at the crossroads of two major interstates um, mm -hmm. we also have the entire front range population as a a buyer i guess if you will and so that is that uh, when it very first started out in its infancy that was the organic market anyways was in that area. Mm -hmm. And so it really is very helpful to have um, location, 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 I guess, if you will. Yes. As you um, think about the, the growth of your business in the growth in the area, um, just generally, what do you think buyers are looking for? Or, or what do you see as like, um, in addition to just a, additional labels, is there some sort of messaging that's going to allow organic to stay ahead of demand and, and keep driving demand or is there some other consideration that you're thinking about as far as where you'd like to invest your time and energy to market and capture the market personally i don't know i think the the consumer in general is overwhelmed by labels um i think mm -hmm. that, that they're equally as confused um i'm a farmer i'm an organic farmer and we can go to the store and i'm confused who certified uh -huh. this or what like there's there's so many different variations of the same thing that there mm. almost needs to be some type of industry wide. This is organic. This is regenerative. This is certified by these two companies or whatever. Like there almost needs to be some type. We need to get our own um, group together, I guess, and say, hey, this is what this is, because the consumer in general is a little overwhelmed. And then yeah. almost a consumer education, maybe, I guess, if you will, too, in, in the fact that educating the consumer that what they're buying a is verified and mm -hmm. b that they're doing their that they're willing to part with their hard-earned money and pay a little bit extra to help out the climate or that they that this is guaranteed non-genetically modified or whatever that they're that the consumer is ultimately where it, the push is going to come from i feel absolutely and i've been hearing that from a lot of folks and i i would love to follow up with you on that well, Clint, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us for this call. This has been fantastic. A great way to start a Wednesday. So really appreciate you taking the time. And thank you for the hard work. This is, uh, I think, when we look to how do we build organic, the work you're doing is one of those catalysts that make it possible for other folks. So again, we all thank you for that work. Um, and we'll be in touch. Everybody, we'll do this again next month. And we'll be talking about... Uh, integrating some uh, different crops, especially clover, into a cereal rotation. But for now, happy Wednesday, and thank you again for joining us. Thanks again, Thanks Clint. for having me. I appreciate it. Take care.